back to John chapter 6, as we are looking at, we've already looked at what a good disciple is, a faithful disciple, a real disciple of Jesus Christ. There, the disciples came back from being sent out to heal the sick. Let's announce that at the end, okay? Let's do that afterwards. But back to, back to uh, John chapter 6. I forgot to announce it, but it'll be more effective if we do it at the end. Anyway, John 6, the disciples, Jesus had sent them into the villages. And he told them to go and proclaim the kingdom, heal the sick, cast out demons. And they went and they did this. Remember, these were the works that only Jesus was doing up to this point. And now he empowers them and sends them forth. And then they obeyed and did. And they come back, surely anxious to report and tell how things went. Now Jesus, in the meantime, I don't know if it's while they were gone or if they were there. But about the same time, he receives word of John the Baptist's death. So they're going to go off aside. They needed rest. They needed refreshment. They had not eaten. And so they go into a desert place. The crowd follows them. Jesus has compassion. So he teaches them. He heals them. And the day is spent. There's no place to buy food. And Jesus, you know the story, tells them, you feed them. And after that largest of all the miracles, in the extent that more people actively participated and observed that miracle than any other that he did that's recorded in Scripture. After that whole thing where he taught the disciples, you need to serve others. Even in this moment when you're hungry, you're desiring rest, and you're desiring to be away from the crowds, sometimes a servant leader must, after all that great experience out in the villages, you now come and you serve tables. And then we saw the Wednesday night, we looked at the walking on the water, the, the storm and the disciples in the boat, and Peter wanted to get out of the boat and go to where Jesus was on the water. He taught them a private lesson. They had not, the Bible says they did not grasp the meaning of the feeding of the 5,000. They considered not, Mark 5, uh, Mark 6, 52, I think it is, says. And the word consider means they didn't put the event with the significance. So with all that being done, they now are back on the shore. And the, the multitude that ate the fishes and the loaves the day before... They've been watching all night. It says that boat with the disciples left. Jesus didn't go in it. They're watching and they realize Jesus isn't here, but he didn't leave on the boat. So they get their boats and they go and they track Jesus down in Capernaum and they ask him the question, how did you get here? Now the focus in verses 22 to the end of the passage, for all but two verses basically focus on false disciples. And we looked at some of those characteristics. For the first characteristic we looked at in the last hour was they focus on the temporal and the physical, the here and now, and not the eternal and the spiritual. Secondly, they focus on works. What should we do to work the works of God? Remember they asked Jesus, how did you get here? That's a temporal, mundane thing. Sometimes people are more concerned with the things with no eternal value than those that are part of the grand, greater picture. Secondly, they're focused on their works. What can we do rather than believe? Because Jesus is going to stress to them that they must believe on him. Thirdly, they focus on sight. Okay, Lord, if, if it's not a work we do, but we have to believe on him that the Father sent, then what will you do that we can see that we might believe on you? Now, just for a moment, they have seen him heal the sick, heal the lame, the blind, the deaf, the dumb, the lepers raise the dead. They saw him the day before make that little boy's snack into a banquet for over 20,000 people, likely. What more do they need to see to believe that he is indeed the Son of God and that his message is to be listened to? And there are people that they will listen and listen and listen and listen and evaluate, but they say, well, I'm trying to make up my mind whether I'm going to believe in this or which denomination or which religion or which doctrine I'm going to follow. There are disciples like that. They are going to decide what is truth and what is not. And as we pointed out in the last hour, they try to determine what their truth is. There is no your truth or my truth. There's one truth, and that is the truth of God. And we either align with that or we are wrong. 
period. That's what the scripture teaches us. And our culture today is going headlong into that error of thinking that we can somehow determine truth. Well, fourthly, we saw that a false disciple, he desires eternal life without a relationship. Easy believism. He said, Lord, would you always give us this bread, that real true bread? If Moses didn't give them the true bread, that bread from heaven. Notice that word that in this text. If he didn't give them that, then you give us that bread since you are that true bread. And he says, I am the bread of life. Verse 35, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I say unto you that ye have also seen me, and you, present active indicative verb, means you are actively choosing not to believe in me. It's not that they haven't been persuaded yet. It's not that they haven't been exposed to the truth. It's that they have been exposed and they choose not to believe. America is that nation today. I don't know of a nation, perhaps more than Israel itself, that has been more exposed to the truth of the word of God and has chosen not to believe. It is a tragedy for our country. And the judgment upon those that have done this, it will be more severe than those who have not been exposed to the truths that we have been exposed to. So he goes on to explain how you do this. Verse 40 says, And this is the will of God that sent me. His will is that all be saved, but only some will. We know that few there be that find that narrow and straight gate that leads to life. It says, But the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son... How do we see the Son today? Through the Word of God. And believeth on Him, then we commit that we will place our faith in what He has said. May have present tense everlasting life, and I will raise Him up at that day. So this idea of easy believism isn't the way of salvation. You don't just magically say some words and get saved. You must have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You must be born again. And that brings us to number five. This is where we pick up from last time. They reject the way of salvation. They reject the way of salvation. Do you realize that every religion and Christian denomination and cult and occult that do not believe in salvation by grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ and his finished work on Calvary. They're rejecting God's way of salvation. Now this includes some very prominent and very, quote unquote, Christian denominations that we know and familiar with. And they look almost indistinguishable from Baptists. But if you do not follow that way of salvation, you're rejecting God's way of salvation. Look at this group of the Jews. The Jews then murmured at him. They, they, They didn't like this. They were seeking him. They sought him all night. They didn't come and find him. I mean, they were persistent. But now they're murmuring because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? He grew up right here in Galilee, over in Nazareth. And remember what Nathaniel said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? It was a despised place. And you're telling me the Messiah has come out of Nazareth? He's the one that came down from heaven and we're to believe in him? They were were griping and says, I I don't buy that. I'm not going to follow him. How is it that he saith, I came down from heaven? We know where he came from. And Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. Now, these verses, folks, this passage, there's a conflict in this passage. And and there's a theological conflict in which many will look to say, see, you have the sovereignty of God, and you do. No one can come to Jesus unless the Father draws him. If he doesn't draw you, even if you want to get saved, you cannot get saved. So as you see there, God elects, he chooses, and he determines who's going to be saved and who's not. And then yet, you go to the previous passage in verse 33, what we looked at. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto what? 
the world. And you have that conflict between those who will teach that God limits the atonement of Christ to those who are elect, and then those who say that, no, he died for the sins of the whole world. Well, the Bible clearly says he died for the sins of the whole world. But only those that God foreknew in the beginning will be saved because he knows the heart of man and he knows the choice they will make. Yes, you have the sovereignty of God, you have the election of God, and yes, you have the free will and responsibility of man, both hand in hand. But you must understand this idea of, well, I'll wait and choose when I'm good and ready. I'd advise against it. Because you have no guarantee that God will draw you at a later date. No man can come unless the Father draw him. Verse 45, it is written in the prophets, And they shall be all taught of God, and every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, this is the third time that express amen, amen has been used in this passage. We saw the first two in the, other, in the previous hour. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Aorist tense. It means it occurs at one point in time with abiding results. That means at the moment we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we are saved at that moment you have everlasting life. John 5, 24, you will not come into condemnation. Future tense, you will never again come into condemnation. Past tense, but you have. So you're already past that moment which you believe. So at that moment back there when you believe, whether it be five seconds ago or 50 years ago, at that moment you passed from death unto life. And it is assured not by our works and our abilities, but by the hand and power of God and the finished work of Christ on Calvary. So he said, verily, verily, this is one of those statements. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if you will believe, you have everlasting life. And then he goes on to give the theology. Notice how the theology keeps getting deeper and deeper as we get to the end of the passage. And we're going to see that the deeper the theology gets, the more those false disciples don't want to hear it. They're going to murmur, they're going to reject, and they're going to walk away. Well, look at this. It says, I am that bread of life. He didn't say, I'm the bread of life. He could have. But he's making contrast. Remember, they said, Moses, you know, our fathers, they ate manna in the wilderness. Can you do that? And Jesus made the contrast. says, Moses didn't give that bread. He gave manna, which is a type and picture of Christ, but I am that bread or that true bread that God sent. So he's making that contrast. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness, and they're dead. They ate it for 40 years, and they're dead. And if I feed you bread every day for the next years till you die, you will still be dead. Stop focusing on that which has no eternal value. Is it important to eat every day? Yes, it is. But more importantly is where will you spend eternity? What are eternal values here? I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which is come down from heaven, if any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. Wow. You have any doubts that it's eternal life? He says, if you eat of this bread, you'll live forever. But he's going to go even further. And he's going to tell them how he's going to do it. And this is really going to upset some of them. He says, and the bread that I give is my flesh. And I will give for the life of the world. Again. Only few are going to come to Christ, but he died for the sins of the whole world. The provision is for the whole world. The whole world is not saved. Why? John 3, 18. Because they love darkness rather than light. Period. But they rejected the way of salvation. There are reasons people reject. Sometimes it's rationalism. I know where you came from, Jesus. You, you were born in Nazareth. We know your dad. We know your brothers and sisters. You're no Messiah. What do you, we don't know how you're doing all these tricks. Well, it's, it's impressive. We've seen it, but no. We're, they, they rationalize themselves out of heaven. 
Oh, I don't go to church because I see what church people do. You may have your righteous indignation and you may go to hell with it because you rationalize your way out of heaven. Other people's lives do not determine whether you go to heaven or hell, but what you do with Jesus Christ does. They will also, not only they rationalize, they have prejudices. You're from Nazareth. You're from Galilee. The Judeans would say that about him, the high priests and the others. These Galileans, has any prophet, good prophet come out of Galilee? And they would laugh. That's absurd. No significant person has ever come out of Galilee. So prejudice will take us away from salvation. And rejection. I don't like your way. I, I told you about the occasion where we witnessed to a man. I believe it was there in Brazil. And I believe I've heard the same answer here in the United States too. And you go through the plan of salvation. You go through their need of salvation. They acknowledge their sinners. They acknowledge that they need a Savior. And I said, do you want to receive Jesus? Christ? No, I, I can't do that. I said, why not? I can't believe in a God that would send people to hell. Another person said, no, I need to do something. Go back to the works, what I can do for my salvation. And they'll never be saved. Because it is not dependent on those things. Those things cannot save us. They reject the way of salvation. Not only do they reject the way, they reject the doctrine of salvation. Look at verses 52 and following. Now, as I said, it keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper. We could spend probably half a month to a month on this passage and not exhaust it. It requires a lot of discipline not to go to Hebrews and many other passages to expound upon what few words are being said here. But it is a tremendous, powerful theological passage. But this part really, really starts to get to them. And some of us will look at it, we'll kind of scratch our heads and say, Jesus, did you really have to say it that way? But he did. Look at verse 52. The Jews, therefore, strove among themselves. And this word strove means they had a, a war of words. They were fighting amongst themselves. They said, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? That is against the law of Moses. That is immoral. To eat human flesh or eat human or drink human blood, that is, they're to be put to death for that. You cannot do this. And here he's saying he will give us his flesh to eat. They, they, they were beside themselves. And you, you think Jesus would at this point say, no, 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 you got me all wrong. Let me explain. But here's the problem. Unbelievers who are rejecting the gospel had no spiritual insight. And he's going to illustrate this because he will show later, down in verse 63, that he is speaking spiritually, not literally. That it's not literal flesh, but he's speaking spiritually. Now, his flesh will be sacrificed on the cross of Calvary. He will lay down. His body will die. His blood will be shed. That is literal. But the eating of it is something different. Let's read the passage. Verse 53, And Jesus said unto them, again, verily, verily, this is very important. So it's not a secondary thing we just gloss over because it's, it bugs us to try to explain it. We need to pay closer attention to it. He said, Except, or unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now he didn't go the other way to try to calm this thing down. He blew it up bigger, didn't he? He said, I'm going to tell you something. You don't have any life in you if you don't eat the flesh of the, blood of the Son of Man and drink his blood. Again, are you violating Mosaic law? No. He's trying to get you to see things spiritually and not physically. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath now eternal life. And I will raise him up at, that last, at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, and even he shall live, in, live by me. This is that bread. Look at that word again. This is that bread which came down from heaven, 
not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Now understand, these guys were alive, physically speaking. They had life, physical life in them. So obviously he's not speaking of the physical. He's speaking of the spiritual, which he will clarify even more in the next passage. But what he's saying is you've got to understand the only sacrifice that pays the penalty of sin is death. The, the wages of sin is death. The, the price for our sin is death. The Old Testament saints, they saw all of those animals being slaughtered and the blood applied so that their sins could be covered. But now Jesus would come and his flesh would be sacrificed. He would lay down his physical life. Because you and I, that's what we will pay for our sins with. Not only our physical life, but then eternity in hell. That's what we deserve. That is the judgment of God against sin. But he loved us so much, he sent his son to die in our place. And his, his body, what's the difference between his and ours? Well, number one, he qualified to be the sacrifice where we don't. We are not sinless. Our, we are not a spotless lamb. We are not a sinless sacrifice. So even if we did lay down and shed our blood for our own sins, we could not redeem ourselves. So that one who had no sin came and he became sin for us. But not only was he buried, he rose again. And because he rose again, we also have that assurance that we too shall rise again at that day, as he's promising here. You see, it's a, it's a spiritual thing. They need to understand that all of what God had shown them for thousands of years has now come to fruition in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So that bread's in front of you. You have seen it. And you don't believe. Actively, you're choosing not to believe, as we saw a few verses back. They reject the doctrine of salvation. Now, some, by the way, let me, let me just point something out here. You may have heard this. Some confuse this passage to be speaking of the Lord's Supper. You know, the bread and the blood. and okay, there, are, there are similarities, but it has nothing to do with that. Number one, he, he has not even shared that with the 12 yet, the 12 apostles. Why would he be sharing this with a group of unbelieving Jews who are antagonistic to his message? It would not be the place to do that. Number two, he makes it clear that uh, he was not speaking in literal terms. He says that down, look in verse 63. It is spirit that quickeneth and flesh unto you. You know, it, it is spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are what? Spirit and they are life. A third reason that eating and drinking are absolutely essential to eternal life. He said, if you do, unless you eat of this flesh and drink of this blood, you do not have life in you. So that means that you must partake of that in order to have eternal life. Now, how many times do we as a church do the Lord's Supper? Here we do it monthly. Do we have to keep doing that if we're now born again? If this is, no, because it has nothing to do with salvation. The two are separate. And then there are those who never partook in the Lord's Supper because it wasn't instituted until the last supper on the night Jesus was to be crucified. What about all those that never had a part in it? No, it's not talking about the Lord's Supper. And finally, the aorist tense of these verbs, they speak of a one-time thing. It happens at one point in time, and the results abide from then on. Everlasting life. You have it right now. Well, that's not the case, because the Lord's Supper is to be done repeatedly until he comes. So we understand it's not. Now, it, neither do you go to the other extreme and say that, as one false religion does, and they say that when you partake of that wafer and of that wine, that when you partake of it, it literally becomes the flesh of Jesus and the blood of Jesus inside you. It's called the doctrine of transubstantiation. That is also no basis whatsoever in Scripture, but often they will base it on this passage. So what is he saying? What does it mean if it doesn't mean literally eating his flesh and drinking his blood? Well, it doesn't mean that. That would be sin. He would never tell us to sin. What it's meaning is just as you ate that bread and the fishes, 
and you eat bread and you drink water to satisfy your daily needs and hunger. When you take it in, your body breaks it down and digests it, and it takes the energy it needs to sustain the life in the body. Just as you do that on a day-to-day -day basis to sustain this perishable life, you must take the words that I am speaking. We're going to see that. What is that, what is that bread? It's the words that he is speaking. When you take that, you believe on it, and you make it a part of your life. You place your whole conviction, your whole trust upon that. Then it becomes part of you. It's, it's internalizing that. It's not just saying, I know it up here and I see it out there. That's not a true disciple. A true disciple is once they come to the point and they say, I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed. That's what my faith of eternal life I put into him and his work until that day what day the day when he will raise us up so that's the that's the that's the doctrine of salvation a false disciple rejects it and the vast number of world religions today christian religions world religions cults and the occult they reject that doctrine of salvation no, you've got to work, you've got to do this, you've got to be baptized. They'll add all sorts of things onto salvation. Many of them are good things, but they're not part of salvation. They're acts of obedience, but not part of salvation. Number seven, they reject the condition of salvation. They reject the condition of salvation. Look at verses 59 to 66. Now these things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. So somehow from a mob or a multitude of people, they've now made their way to a synagogue, and he's in a synagogue where there'd be a much limited, more limited crowd. But some would be in the courtyard around and other places, and they could still hear what he was saying. But many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, this is that hard saying. Who can hear it? So, you know, who can do this, Lord? I mean, who, who in the world is going to be able to follow as your disciple? If you're going to be preaching this stuff, you know, we loved it when you was healing the sick and you were casting out demons. That was cool. And you fed the 5,000. Man, that was the best meal I ever had. But now you're talking about this flesh and blood and dying. and so all of a sudden, they're going to reject the conditions of salvation. It says, who, who, can, who can understand this? And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, notice he's talking to the disciples now, not just the 12, but that larger group that had been following him for some time. Could be in the 70s. We know at one time he sent out 70, two by two. Some estimate it, at times it had been 150 plus. But to that group of, of those who profess to be his disciples and to the multitude, he's, he's saying this. Does this scandalize you? The word scandalizo, offend. Does this scandalize you? There's some things we say that scandalize people, right? I was greeted in church today and one of our dear ladies asked me, says, so how is your better half today? And I said, I'm doing fine. Thank you for asking. She was scandalized by my response. I just still don't understand why. But there are some things we say that scandalize people. I was talking to a man who was handing out tracts in Brazil for another church, another denomination, and he handed me one of his tracts. I handed him one of mine, and he said, oh, we're brothers. And I said, well, he said, let's talk about that. It's okay. I said, how, how, how did you come to know Christ as Savior? Oh, I was baptized and I was this. I said, but if you died today, where would you go? So I hope I'll go to heaven. I said, you don't know for sure? He said, oh, no, nobody can know for sure. I said, I do. He looked at me and said, you can't know that. I said, sure I can. And he looked at me like, who do you think you are? I said, the Lord Jesus said. I said, let me show you in the word of God. And I opened, and he, he was scandalized by that. You can't know. You've got to work and you've got to be faithful. And if you don't leave church and you don't stop doing this and this and this, then you might get in if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. This is a, a, a group called evangelical. 
but preaching works salvation. And I told him, I said, no, Jesus said, you have everlasting life at the moment you believe on him, period. And he walked away, not believing. And Jesus turned to these and says, do these words scandalize you? And they did. But he was teaching a lesson. But notice what he says. He says, do you think this scandalized you? Wait till this great hope you had of making me king and me providing bread for you day by day. What are you going to do if this offends you when I tell you this? What's it going to be when I, you see me ascend into heaven, when I return to the Father? You, you're definitely going to, your faith will go down the river at that point. You'll walk away clearly at that point. He says, what and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the spirit that quickeneth. It's not our works that save us. It's not the words we magically say that save us. It is that repentant heart that places their faith in Jesus Christ and the spirit of God seals us unto the day of redemption. He gives eternal life. And the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that, look at this. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. I am the bread of life. If you believe on me, you'll never hunger, you'll never thirst. If you eat of me, you have everlasting life. You see how he keeps building the theme and now he says, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. How do we get saved? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's salvation, nothing more. What Christ did, and we believe what the Bible says he did and why he did it, we are sinners, we are bound for a Christless eternity, and he sent his son to die in our place. And if we'll place our full trust in what he did and turn from our sins to him, we have everlasting life. But look at the next phrase. But there are some of you that believe not. Again, actively choosing not to. To believe. So now not only have you seen the works that prove who I am, you have eaten of the fish and the bread, but now you have heard the message and you still refuse to believe. That's a false disciple. I don't care how long they've been in church. I don't care how much they have done in the name of the Lord. As we saw there at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not done this and have we not done that and have we not done the other? And they'll say, I will say, depart from me. I never knew you. You never had a relationship with me. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it be given unto him of my Father. From that time, look at this, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. He preached the truth. Oh, they liked it as long as it was, we were getting healed. We were seeing our friends get healed. We were eating of this. We were, we were curious and we were being entertained by all that he was doing. But now that it gets down to the theology, what truly matters, the difference between heaven and hell, mm, we're not sure we want to follow that. And they walked away. They reject the condition. The condition of salvation is this. It's by faith. You believe in what God has said, and you commit to that. Period. And that will transform your life it will change your way you behave. It will change our attitude towards that. Now, I would like to, if we had another hour, we'd go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 tells about those who know the truth, they have heard the truth, been exposed to it, know it, and walk away from it. And the penalty for that. And one of those things of those disciples, it, taught, it says Hebrews 10, 17, it, it, one of the descriptions of those who are not going to go down that path of deserting Christ it says they will forsake not the assembling of themselves together. One of the very first things that we learn about our condition of the heart towards the Lord, our seriousness as a disciple, is what we do with our church attendance. See, the assembling together, that is churching together. That's what a church is. It's an assembly, a called out assembly. 
And our attitude towards the Lord's house speaks to the condition of our heart. Now, I know there are those that physically cannot, that God allowed circumstances to prevent them from being here. But those who can be are to be faithful. That's a faithful disciple. We follow Christ, not men, not convenience, not entertainment, not preference. We follow the Lord. And that, that includes that. Read, go back and read Hebrews chapter 10, the whole thing. And it will describe in great detail not only the false disciples, but also how you can prevent from that. Remember the old things. Remember how you first came to Christ. And go back to those first works. Now look at the final verses very quickly. I'd like to, and someday I may come back and do a message on these final verses. Because when most of those disciples walked away, I don't know about you, but there are people that come to church, and over the years, some get upset over this, get upset over that, and they leave. They say, well, preacher, you, you seem unfazed by it. No, it grieves me. There's no one that likes to see less people here this week than were here last week, and to see people leave. Now, sometimes the Lord takes them home. I'm still upset with Brother Dusty over that. I told him he couldn't go till I went. My brother Marshall's co cooperating with me so far. I said he couldn't go till I go either. So, but the Lord promotes people home. But it, it hurts and grieves to see them go. But the truth is, sometimes people go because they were never of us. That's what that's what the Bible tells us. They went out from among, among us because they never were truly of us. That's sad. So Jesus now turns to the ones that are left. You had this great group of disciples, these multitudes following, and you're in this spotlight and the hype. And then it comes, and one day he preaches, okay, let me give it to you plain and simple, as profoundly as I know how. And they walk away. So he turns to the 12, verse 67. And Jesus, and said Jesus unto the 12, Will you go too? Will you also go away? Now just imagine the hurt in his heart. He came. He's, he's going to lay his... He's now two and a half years almost into his ministry. The, we saw in the beginning of the passage that the Passover was nigh. This is the third Passover. The fourth one in his ministry is when he will be crucified. So he's one year away from the crucifixion at this point. And after all that he's done and all that he's taught and all that he's preached, he and both, John, both he and John the Baptist, and here in this one sermon, this multitude just turns and leaves. So he turns to the twelve and says, what about you? Y'all want to go too? And look at the confession of a true disciple. In spite of all the popular opinion and all the world going and all the these other opinions being contrary. Then Simon Peter, he was the spokesman for the twelve, he answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. I don't know about you, but I think I'd highlight that in my Bible. That is the confession of a true disciple of Jesus Christ. That is the confession of a true believer in Jesus Christ, that unless you come to that conclusion, we can't be saved. You notice how he pointed, he says, Moses didn't give you that bread, but I am that bread, I am that bread, that life. And Simon Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? That's acknowledging he is the only way. No matter who else you follow, they will not lead you to heaven. Family won't do it. Tradition won't do it. Religion won't do it. Church won't do it. Baptism won't do it. Good works won't do it. A good spiritual leader, I, well, I follow so-and-so on TV or on this podcast, or on that, they're not going to save you. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. You see, he died on the cross. But we are saved by believing what the word of God says that he did and why he did it. And why we need that salvation. And he said, we believe. 
And the word believe there is the word pistuo, which comes from the word faith in the Greek. So it's not just a belief that, oh, we acknowledge the facts. He's saying, we have place. And then he says, and we are sure. That's the word gnosko, which is the same word as know. It means I've come to know by experience. We have been walking with you. We have been watching you. And we have been living out what you have said. And we now know from experience. So we have placed our faith, and we have tested it, and we have proven it to be true, that you are that Christ. Oh, there are different messiahs who have come, people trying to pre present themselves to be from God, but they weren't. But you are that messiah, the son of the living God. And that is the recognition we must come to to be saved. And you think that Jesus is okay? Well, I'm going to take this one, you know, it's, it's, by comparison, thousands leave me and 12 stick with me. I'm going to take the win and I'm just going to take whatever encouragement I can get from that and I'm going to walk away, right? No, he points out another truth. And this is probably one of the most tragic passages of Scripture in all the Bible. Jesus answered them, verse 70, Have not I chosen you 12? One of you is a devil. One of you is an adversary, one who opposes me. You're not saved. You don't believe on me. You followed me, Judas Iscariot. Remember, he was one of those political zealots that wanted to overthrow Rome and establish the kingdom and, you know, retrieve power back for them. And they thought, this, is, this Jesus is that one. And so he attached himself in the sense he took the call. But this was prophesied in the Old Testament, that one of the twelve, they would betray him. Even among those that stayed with Jesus, there were still some in there that weren't saved. And this, this is an eye-opener, folks. There are people that will go to church all their lives, grow up in church, they follow that, and they stick with that. But you can do all of that and never come to know Jesus as Savior. I would go through this chapter again and again and read Hebrews 10. And read 1 John, all five chapters. It will tell you the evidences of a truly born-again person. If you have any doubts at all. Because it is possible to be a disciple in name only. And not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. What do we do with this? Well, I would say the first thing to do would be to do a self-examination. There are non-disciples here. They, they don't even follow after Jesus. Says, I'm not going to follow that kook. And they just go about their business. That, that's a non-disciple. A disciple is one who is a learner. He's a, he's a follower, a student. But then there's the convenience disciples. Well, we follow them after convenience. You know, we, we're looking for a cause, and this is a good cause. It appeases my conscience, and so I'm going to stick with that. There are the curious disciples. Hey, I wonder if he'll do a miracle today. I wonder if he'll heal somebody else today. They'll follow him out of curiosity. They're the religious disciples. Oh, I feel like I must do something, so they get involved in religion. They're the betraying disciples. Those that never believe, but they're in there amongst those that do. And then there's the true disciple. That one who says, Lord, to whom else can we go? You have the words of life. We believe and we are sure that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and no matter what anybody else does, I will not walk away from that faith. Where do you stand today? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, a, a very clarifying passage, a powerful passage, but Lord, it's also a very difficult passage. Because here it is placed as a night and day choice. It is placed as an either or condition. If we're to be saved and we're to truly be a disciple of Christ, we must do it his way. Lord, that, that, that goes head on with our own desires, our preferences, our beliefs that we can follow you and serve you the way we want to without any concern for our testimony and our outward life. Or we worry about the outward life with the neglect of the inward life. 
Lord, I pray you would convict each heart. If there's one hearing this message that does not know Jesus as Savior, they've come to realize that I've never really become a true disciple. Would you convict that heart and bring them to a saving knowledge where they know they have everlasting life now? Or for those that may be following for many different reasons, but they are not truly committed disciples, convict that heart. And Lord, for those that truly believe and are following, strengthen them in these dark and difficult days that we might proclaim your truth, not ours, but your truth, that the world may hear and they might believe on the only Son of God. Apply your word now as you see fit through your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen.